of all, I was going to ask, uh, how has everybody here worked with Tri-X film before? Or yes. black and white film or any film? Yes. Yep. Years ago. <laughs> okay. Years. Um, I'm not going to get too deep into using it, but it was more of, uh, this was the only way we could get photos in the newspapers back in the 70s and 80s. So that's basically what I'm talking about tonight. Uh, everyone had settled on uh, to Tri-X film. Anyway, this is a self-portrait I did of myself in the uh, News Chronicle office in 1983. Um, at this point, I had already worked for about five newspapers around the country. So all these press passes and the front page of News Chronicle, and I used the lower end Canon E1 programs in those days. So, okay. And if any, basically what I was gonna do tonight was uh, um, do about a, 12 slides here that I have and then open it up for questions. And then I've got a bunch of my work for, that I did during the uh, years at the News Chronicle. I worked there eight years. Um, basically, I got a degree in journalism from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo in 1975. And I worked at newspapers in California, Massachusetts and Florida. And in 1982, ended up in Thousand Oaks when they were shorthanded and then ended up making a career out of it. Stayed there eight years. In the last couple of years, I was a photo editor and things like that there. Um, and then in 1990, when the LA Times is expanding in Ventura County, I jumped ship and went over to the LA Times and retired from there in 2015. And uh, I'm a past president of the uh, Press Photographers Association of Greater Los Angeles. I was the president in 86, 87. So um, anyway, that's my background. Uh, the library was able to share this 1971 photo of the News Chronicle building they were filming a uh, show called uh, O'Hare U.S. Treasury. And um, there's the only photo that I had available to show the old building. It's only the, uh, well, it's now the left half. Um, it's a two-story building. And I think you all know it's a, a um, it's now a 24-hour fitness. Uh, it's at 2595 Thousand Oaks Boulevard. The area on this photo to the right was added in 1984. Uh, the area to the left was uh, the original building. And that was, it all started in the fifties as a Baptist, I think it was a Baptist church and the baptism became the dark room. So that was a little thing I always laughed about. Uh, and then sometime in the late sixties, they added a second floor. That's where the newsroom was. And then I, as I was saying in 84, they added the uh, uh, big area to the right. And then, of course, when they closed 92, it went up for sale. And they, unlike a lot of newspaper buildings, this one has survived and never got torn down. Um, in the 80s, uh, I, these are not cameras that I had in those days. I picked these up recently, the last couple of years off of eBay and whatever, but it's the same kind of camera gear I was using. Um, in fact, the one in the back right at 2028 was one of my favorite lenses. But we basically, all newspaper photographers in those days, used um, basically prime lenses. Uh, zoom lenses were not very well, not very good yet. And with all the, the indoor and nighttime photography we had to do, we needed fast primes. So we usually carried uh, usually two or three camera bodies. And one of the reasons is that you'd always keep a third body with film in it in case you were in a critical situation where you, one of your cameras ran out of film. So it was one of those things where you had to balance thing is um i found this photo recently of me at the uh train derailment there was a big train derailment in 1983 near moore park college and um so i made it i kept this one for a nice portrait to show what i looked like in those days um i'm carrying two camera bodies and on the right of my is a donkey bag it's called that was the uh popular camera bag that all newspaper photographers in that era was using. And uh, this is the current version of Tri-X. Let's see, go into my notes here. Uh, Tri-X film from Kodak was released um, back in the 40s as a sheet film. And in 1954, they released the 35 millimeter version of it. Um, and by the time I started in photojournalism in the early 70s, it was already rated at 400 ASA. 
And I played with plus X and tri X, but every, like everyone else, we all settled on tri X at 400 because it could be easily pushed. And in, in small newspapers, you had to shoot a lot of indoor sports in high school stadiums and gymnasiums. So we usually pushed it to 1600 and would use Diphine A and B was the most popular developer for the, uh, at 1600, at 400 is usually D76. Some people like to do it one-to-one -one and go from there. Um, basically, uh, with all the newspapers I worked at before, everyone did their own darkroom work. And it, looking back on it, it took about 30 minutes to develop the film and get it dry. And if you wanted the best quality, you had to stick to keeping everything at the exact temperature and have, you, depending on what kind of agitation you wanted to use also affected the contrast. Um, basically, this is a typical rundown of the uh, steps you would have to take. And uh, there's plenty of places online that explain this more. But then after you get your film, you spend another 30 minutes to have to edit the negatives, make a couple of prints and then add captions to the back. So just to do one assignment is usually uh, an hour of lab time, okay? And because you could do double up on the processing and everything, you, a typical photographer in those days would shoot three or so photo assignments in a day. It could be anything from like tra traffic accidents to whatever, uh, sports events. And then you would have to do about a minimum of two hours of darkroom work. Now, when I got to the News Chronicle, we didn't do tray printing. Um, in fact, when I first came in 1982, the News Chronicle had a tiny dark room that was the size of a large walk-in closet. And because there was so little space, the, uh, we had to, uh, we signed, we had four photographers, rotated shifts every month, and one, one photographer, photographer was always doing the lab work. So um, he would, the lab person would start at 7 a.m., collect all the film from all the photographers and do one big film run, okay? And he would have an hour to process usually about 15 to 20 rolls of film that would be at both 400, 1600, or even 3200 ASA. So he'd have to do three tanks. And then it would, with, in that one hour, he'd have to produce proof sheets with the negatives attached to them, okay? This is a typical proof sheet we would do in that one hour lab, lab time. So of course, at this end, because of the mass processing, you had to keep your exposures pretty consistent and if you're gonna maintain any kind of quality. So this is from a, a, a football game from 1984. Uh, the assignment slips would be attached to the film and the, then the assignment slips in the film would be, the film was stapled in glassing envelopes on the back and it would stay with the proof sheets. Then the proof sheets would go to page editors, get marked up for page sizes. And then on back on that, on this mach machine, similar to this one, um, it has two bottles, uh, an activator and stabilizer. And the black and white paper usually had a, an activator chemical built into it. Um, and then the lab tech would take be printing the prints to exact size that they'd end up in the paper. Um, as I said, uh, it became a very uh, assembly line operation. Um, at this point, can I, does anybody have any questions? I'm just going through this real fast. Um, when anything we want to explain more, or go into a little more. Okay, uh, I was gonna say that um, later on, in 1984, we got a bigger dark room. We always continued to have a lab tech, but um, the uh, uh, the idea of doing individual lab work, we were able to do that a little more. Um, normally, main thing about shooting triax is you're doing everything is aimed toward getting the best reproduction in the newspaper. It's not for making high quality wall prints, and in a, in a real deadline situation, uh, the photographers knew how to uh, shorten that development time, printing time, and get something done. 
my, uh, I think my record was about 20 minutes of walking into the lab with a roll of film and walking out with a print. Okay. Uh, I know photographers, I had one guy I knew back in Boston, he had nine minute record for processing a roll of triax and coming out with a print and getting that to the camera room so they could make their, get it into the newspaper. So um, that is uh, basically the process. Now this print I found uh, last week in my stuff I still have, and it's actually from the News Chronicle library. I borrowed it and guess I never got back. But uh, um, so it has the data publication and caption on the back. Um, but were, the original print was printed on uh, one of those stabilization processes. And I darkened the edges and things in uh, Lightroom after I scanned it. But uh, um, we used to, uh, to improve the reproduction in something like the face of this uh, uh, Sparky here. Uh, looking at it later, I think it was bleached. The potassium ferrocyanide is a chemical that uh, basically bleaches and you can use the lighten and you'd use the fixture on the print to stop the bleaching. And on every almost seemed like about half the photos we were doing bleaching or grabbing a grease pen, pen a green pen, grease pencil, getting some of the black on the print and then using nose grease off our nose to actually darken those areas. These were blown out highlights and generally printed kind of dark and that's the, the way we wanted it. <laughs> so, um, Now that's all I had right now. Is there, uh, I was trying to give a quick interview overview of what it was like in newspaper work, but um, on a typical day we would get, uh, we, these are the typical photo assignments that we would get. And uh, using a Thomas guide map, we would go out and do our assignments and then come back to the lab. So any questions? Uh, how did it go from, from your print into the newspaper? What was it? Okay. Every, uh, all of, if you're familiar with the printing process, they have a large, it's basically a camera, but it takes like, it takes basically uh, 16 by 20 size film. And what they do is they, um, the actual uh, pages are printed on, or page negatives are made on the, this camera. Well, the same camera is also used to make uh, what they call half tones. Um, they have a material back in those days where the uh, the receiving material was underneath a special negative. It was a negative type material, but it put half tones in the uh, the screen that goes over the material. And then they, it, it's basically like a large camera. You you take a picture of the print, and it turns it into a half tone. Okay, and from that basically just put wax on the back of this half tone print and put that on a paste up page. So hold on. Okay, everybody can still see me in the side screen. Yeah. Okay, I just want to make sure because uh, um, I have a couple of old newspaper copies here. And when you have a whole page of the of a newspaper, they'll have a, 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 a large page, it's all pasted up and all the text is, each text is in separate strips. Uh, it's pasted on a pasteboard type thing. They have a masthead that they reuse. Uh, and then of course uh, the photo would be half tone. And it, but with color, it's the same process. There's just a few extra steps with color. But uh, everything at the printing operation to get it to the presses is also a photography type of uh, operation. Um, I don't know how technical you want me to get, but uh, it's again all, um, and some of the things there's a gentleman named Danny uh, uh, Domingos, Manny Domingos, who was in charge of our camera room in those days, the News Chronicle. And um, I still see him on Facebook all the time. Uh, he was an expert at making color separations manually. And so for years we did, uh, the News Chronicle would publish a color photo on Thursdays. 
And after the expansion, of course, a lot of things changes and started around 1985. Um, we started, I think it was the Kodak Ectoflex system. I don't know if anybody remembers that. It was a, a color print system that was actually high, pretty good quality and all the wire services started using them. But uh, in late eighties, we were experimenting with shooting a lot more color negative film. And uh, actually at one point we were shooting uh, slide film. At the same time, we'd have to shoot black and white and then pull the other camera out and shoot color. It was a little complicated, but, uh, um, but the whole point is, uh, you know, just making deadline and making sure the photos look look nice in reproduction. That was the goal. Did you have to buy your own equipment or did they supply uh, At the uh, Thousand Oaks paper, you had to buy your own camera gear. That was pretty normal around the country, but they provided all the film paper uh, and all the supplies. And, once, and then you get to larger papers like the LA Times where they provided a company car, company equipment, and, uh, um, and all the and all the all that was provided. So, did you ever uh, soup the film in a uh, one uh, chemical? You know, th there's a developer picture. You can put it in, you know, one shot and do it in a in a quick hurry. No, I never did that. I don't know when that came along. Um, I was doing black and white processing until probably the last time I really did any darker work was the mid '90s. Because by then we started having a lot of digital cameras and. Uh, I got rid of my dark room back about that point too. But um, yeah, the, uh, all those steps that they, you can do for high quality, you can condense the time down by agitating more, cutting your development time a little bit, but also pushing the temperature up to around 75 or 77 degrees. Um, and then uh, when it comes time, if you're in a real hurry, you, you just squeegee dry, the negatives so they're still damp but then you would stick that in the enlarger and make your print and with that stabilization machine you could actually crank out stuff pretty fast usually the hardest part for everyone was actually trying to get the captions done on deadline so um so you'd almost have to dictate them sometimes to uh, an editor so i i, I have a question on yeah. uh, the processing i yeah. understand that uh, from what you said that you were when you made your prints, you made them the size you needed in the newspaper. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Uh, how did you know ahead of time what size you would have to paste up when you were in, okay. your, in your dark room? Okay. Like I said, I was going pretty quick. So go ahead. And if I've gone over something, be sure to ask. Okay. When at the News Chronicle, the proof sheet would go to the page editors. The page editor, as they designed their page, would order the prints on the proof sheet showing crop marks, you know, if I show one here. Yeah, if you look in the lower left of this uh, proof sheet, um, there's a crop marks around one of the sizes there. And I don't think you can read the size here, but, um, and the other number on there is indicating I scanned this back in 2010. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I was by my note keeping on there. But they, the proof sheet with the negatives uh, and stapled to the back in those uh, envelopes, you can see it sticking out on the left, left top. Um, these, those would go back to the lab. And um, then the lab check would print them to size. And then it would go to the camera room. The reason they did this is because they, they had a lot, the News Chronicle in the 80s published a lot of photos. And a lot of photos were all different sizes. And they only had one of these big cameras. And by keeping the camera at, set at 100%, it, it really cut down the amount of time it took to uh, resize photos from typical eight by 10 prints they would get. So it was one of those things that had to be done on deadline. Now, all the proof, well, many of the proof sheets and negatives are now at the Thousand Oaks Library. They have a News Chronicle collection there. Um, and back in 2016, you know, 2016, 2015 and 2016, I was able to work over there as a volunteer and actually go back through a lot of my old proof sheets and help get them archived and scanned and things like that. And then with an illness in the family, I had to stop that volunteer job. And now they've kind of stepped back from the special collections right now with COVID and everything else. Can't do that kind of work anymore. 
but I've been doing this, uh, getting ready for this talk. I found I found about 25 more proof sheets, and I got to get to the library. So, yeah. um, basically, the News Chronicle Monday through Friday was an afternoon paper. So the press run happened at like 11:45 or 11:30 in the morning. They would start the press run, and it would take about an hour. Um, and then, the, of course, then papers would be there. The idea was to get the papers to everybody by five o'clock when they came home from work. That was the way an evening newspaper worked in those days. So we were doing everything in the morning. <laughs> um, uh, the, to clarify, so the entire paper was mocked up at a hundred percent, and all pasted yeah, everything up. that except there were still there were still be things like handout photos. Um, and uh, those, they, they would try to shoot those in the afternoon, the day before. A lot of feature page stuff that was using handout photos of, you know, publicity photos, things like that. They would still have to resize those. But when they got down in the morning on deadline, they were trying to keep everything uh, at 100% just to speed up the operation. So we didn't miss deadlines or anything. So the, um, they'd lay out the articles and the pictures and everything. On a, on a paper size sheet of paper and photograph it and then run it through the press? Yeah. Okay. Basically, once they get the, the, the paste up page all together with the half tone prints, the text and everything, then the camera operator would make a full page negative of that. Okay. It's like a big photograph. You make a full page negative of that. And then, then they had a different machine that would burn the plates that go on the presses from that full page negative. And um, then it's when it's on the presses, uh, then they just, you know, the News Chronicle, its peak was about 25,000 circulations. So take about an hour to run all, or a little over an hour or something to run. Actually, it was more like two hours at its peak, I think, because the paper had a lot of pages and ads. So, um, in around 1987, I was in Chatsworth and covering a brush fire. And I was able to get a decent photo about 11 in the morning. And knowing the deadlines by then, I rushed back to the office and got a photo of the brush fire in the paper that day. And that was the time I got it done, done in around 20 minutes. So all the darkroom work. Um, basically, uh, a lot of photographers in Southern California were not stuck with this. I, you know, I was in this special circumstance situation. But a lot of photographers tended to overexpose and underdevelop to cut the contrast of Trix film. And that was a Southern California photographer's way of doing it. You know, exposed around 320 ASA. And the, uh, the idea was to get quality. On the uh, complete opposite range, up in the Seattle area, the photographers up there usually shot their film at ASA 1000. And then uh, um, because the, of the overcast skies and weather conditions up there, it was the negative, your negative would be pretty flat if you just did it normally. So they took to the process of, uh, you know, underexposing and overdeveloping. And they usually used AccuFine as, as a developer. Um, I, I got to use a lot of uh, Diafine A and B for the 1600 I had to shoot a lot at with the night, Friday night football games. And uh, any night, night basketball and things like that. Um, the uh, the other uh, toward the last few years, I also experimented at shooting at thirty two hundred, and you would use HC one ten developer, actually the replenisher, and you would make one take one ounce of the replenisher and mix it with fifteen ounces of water, and that would give you the sixteen ounces to do a two roll tank. So. Um, Let's see what we're we doing on time. Oh, we're about halfway. So why don't we, uh, why don't I stop this and you have any questions? Any other questions at this time? Scott, this is Roy Patience. I, yeah. I was wondering with all of the speed that was applied to things like prints and negatives, are they are are the negatives still holding up after all these years, or yeah. are they? Yeah. Oh, that's that's amazing. Yeah, because I have a lot of the negatives, and I never had to watch. 
usually what happened is with the prints, the stabilization process, those things would start fading within a few weeks, like a month, especially if you let, left them out in underneath in just regular room light. Um, if you stuck them in a drawer and left them in a dark area, they would hold up a little better. But we tried to anything that was important. Uh, the librarian quite often ended up having to do this. They actually had a librarian at the News Chronicle. The prints would get taken back into the lab and they would actually run them through fixer and wash them. And that's how many of the prints had to be preserved. So it was really uh, preservation of the prints was the hardest part. But the negatives uh, have held up pretty well, all the ones that I've seen. And I've seen I, a lot of them now over the years. I have an old print taken of my daughter. Yeah. But I think by the, must have been the very last days of the News Chronicle. Mm -hmm. And and it's been stuck in a dark drawer, but it it's developing a little bit of an almost like a metallic cast to it. So yeah, that would be the stabilization process. Yeah, so I'll I'll have to get Mike Rayburn to run it through a tank of a tray full of fixer one day for me. Yeah, fix and wash it, and it'll stop whatever degradation uh -huh. is already. It won't get any worse. Is what will happen. So I have a question about the color negatives. Uh, did you process them in house? C forty one. Would you, uh... Uh, yeah, well, actually, what happened is uh, the News Chronicle, as many newspapers, got into a big rush to get in the color. We first, first, I was actually the one that went out and researched and got the, I think it was called the Ectoplex machine, that basically you exposed the color paper in the darkroom, and then it got sandwiched with a uh, similar type of material like that stabilization process, and then you'd end up peeling them apart after a couple of minutes similar to a Polaroid almost. But that made, uh, the color was actually pretty good on that. Uh, and it was, you didn't have to spend a lot of times reprinting trying to get the color exactly right. Color and the printing color in those days was uh, pretty hard. Um, I was amazed at the, some of the color they were able to get before this Ectopress system came out. And of course, Kodak after uh, later in the eighties just discontinued the whole thing because they weren't making any money on it. But um, Basically, we got a Wink Lynch machine. I think that was around 85. Um, that there's a machine that automatically did all the processing. And we were doing chromes for a while and that's why they got that machine. So we used to um, be able to run all our color negatives and stuff and that improved the quality because you know, a machine like that kept everything at the same temperature. Um, when I got to the LA Times around 1990, they were all using machines that were similar to 60 minute photo labs. It was a closed thing where the chemicals didn't get dumped down the drain. Um, but that was uh, also they could recover silver and things like that. But uh, uh, so I never really had to do much color processing myself, but I have done C41 and actually did some uh, E6 at one point or another. But by 1995 or so, I was pretty burned out on darkroom work so I moved on um, I know I've kind of rattling away here so uh, any other questions uh, yeah moving away from process and and developers and fixers and everything is there a memorable shoot that you either wish that you hadn't had to do or <laughs> one that you really enjoyed okay um Oh, I've got a couple here that I, uh, I was ready to start showing you. So why don't I just jump in here? This is, uh, um, let me change this to, single page, yeah. Okay. Um, I think I may have shown a few of these before, but I really enjoyed uh, just covering events. Um, and this was, of course, a, a graduation. And you look for the moments, you try to zero in on a moment. I should back up and say that at every event, or every time, every type of news event or sports event or anything, I tried to do an overall photo and then tighter shots because you never know when they want to do multiple photos of one event. So you need to, to do the, you know, the, as they always say, the classical overall, middle shot, and tight shot. 
uh, this photo, I was up and just shooting sunset and this, this photo uh, was on a roll of film that I hadn't even selected the print and a page editor saw it and it ended up winning several awards and running in a, a national magazine. So I think it was a kamikaze uh, pelican in the middle we were all joking about. Um, I was up uh, in 1983, they drained Lake Sherwood and this was a story that I spent a lot of time on. Uh, and when they drained the lake, it created all the, the, the creek nearby, it just became a big mud pit and kids love to play in it. So that's where I got this photo from. And I really loved the uh, Renaissance Pleasure Fair in the 82, 83, 84. Go on my own time a lot on the weekends. Um, it was just a very visual look, very visual. It just period, just all sorts of nice photos to be taken. Uh, this photo, I was at this location, a construction site about a week before. It was, I think it was like a groundbreaking or first shovel turn or something like that. And they were talking about blowing up the hillside. So I made sure I found out when they were gonna do it and went back and got this image. So um, this is up uh, on the, what is it, the south side of the 101 freeway um, where the furniture, big furniture building is now. Have any questions as I go through these? <laughs> Great show. Oh, thank you. Thank you, yeah. Now this was one of the stories that I really enjoyed working on. Uh, I, before North Ranch was uh, completely built in, I found this sheep herder up there. He was uh, from Peru, okay? And he didn't speak any English, but he was very happy to have me around to have company. And I ended up doing a whole photo page on him in the News Chronicle. As you know, there's a lot of, been a lot of sheep around the area for years and uh, he lived in this trailer. <laughs> That's from the same sheep herder story. Excuse me, losing my voice a little bit tonight. And this photo, uh, I had a 20 millimeter lens and a Cal Duth when they always carried the flag out. Um, and this time I just had the idea of staying, let them carry the flag over me. So I shot a, a series of photos with this and uh, it ended up winning a couple of photo awards. So. Marvin Small, I always liked him. He rode a huge uh, oversized bicycle in CVD parades in those years. And I uh, always loved this photo of him. He was au doing auctions of Agora High School football films. I think they looked like 16 millimeter films that they probably did in the 60s or 70s. And they, used, they were auctioning off the old films to alumni as a fundraiser for the football program. Um, and this is uh, Tumbleweed Jack. Um, I met him at the first anniversary party of the Thousand Oaks Library. So that was in 83. The library had been built. I, I, the library opened in February and I arrived in, uh, uh, in April of that year in 82. And the lady that's now my wife was doing the PR public relations for the library. So um, 85, we got married. I, of course, I met her through my work. So it has a personal thing with me. Um, this is Lee Weiner. He uh, worked at the LA Times in the 50s. And then in the 60s, he was a contract photographer with Life Magazine. And he was teaching a class at UCLA. So I had to take his picture. Um, of course, the uh, Caneo Valley days. And that was just the stage lighting. Any questions on these photos or? They're all Demo Tri-X, right? Yeah, yeah. 
question too did anybody use a medium format like rollies or anything like that as well no as not device? for uh, regular newspaper work you might see uh, uh pr photographers with using uh 120 film because they were trying to get higher quality or commercial photographers when uh, we were doing freelance work you would see people with larger formats um but for deadline uh purposes and everything you pretty much had to shoot and run run and gun is what i used to call it so. and this was one of my favorite photos from Caneo valley days it rained that year so. Now, Barber Chuck Jordan, I don't know if anybody here knows or knew him. Uh, he had, his house was in the corner of, uh, it was just one door from the corner of uh, Arbalus and uh, Moore Park Road. And I guess back in the early 60s, the house was used as the Ventura County Sheriff Station for Thousand Oaks. So his barber shop was where the jail used to be. So I made a story out of him and uh, Always love this photo of a guy half asleep. A couple more shots from the barber shop. And uh, we always had police scanners with us, and I heard them doing a, a practice class. This was at Wood Ranch. Um, a uh, Quite often, fire departments all over the country for their train classes try to find old buildings that they can literally just burn down. So this guy is actually tossing gasoline on the building at this point. Uh, Said here in the day off. Uh, I knew these because I used to, one of the places I had worked, I spent two and a half years working for small newspapers in Downey. And uh, I knew these two high schools had a great rivalry and they were both in the CIF playoff game. So I just on my day off, went down and ended up with this photo. Of course, it wasn't good. published in the News Chronicle, but. <laughs> good stuff for S4C. Yeah. And Bob Hope. Um, there was a uh, North Ranch Country Club. It was during a, a, one of these uh, um, charity events and he was the one of the celebrities that showed up. They used to have some really nice big charity events in the North Ranch Country Club. Uh, I assume they still do, but it didn't attract the publicity it used to. Uh, oh, he's fine. Dog walked in. <laughs> um, the portrait of a lady that, uh, um, was uh, uh, Olympus, Olympic gymnastic. And uh, she had to drop out before the 84 Olympics because of back injury, but uh, did a page on her. Sports writer did it all story. And this is one of my favorite uh, food photos. <laughs> Fun playing with a wide angle lens. And of course, in those days we had the Dallas Cowboys every year had their uh, summer camp at uh, Cal Lutheran College. Um, and uh, one of the things that happened is that because the camp was open to the public, the local kids were able to be on the sidelines and the kids would all attach themselves to one player and carry their helmets and water and just be make pals that way. And it was pretty tough on some of the kids when they're player got cut. And uh, set up the tripod and two time exposures, catch a lightning bolt. One of the few times I around Thousand Oaks where they had lightning and repeated in the same area, be able to get this one. I worked in Florida and you know in other areas where the lightning bolts will completely can continue to repeat themselves from the same area. It becomes much easier to catch these kind of images. Um, Michael Drive and Redford, Redfield Avenue, flooding in 83.
And this was again, one of the things I'd go into LA on my own time in 83 uh, protests against the Soviet Union shooting down a airliner. And do you remember Donna Fargo? Anybody? Uh, she was the person who basically kept Caneo Valley Days going during the 80s, but she passed away actually around 84, 85. Um, but uh, they have her old house on um, Hillcrest is now belongs to the uh, park and rec, the, you know, the rec and park department own, has the house. So I'd hang out with her a lot. She introduced me to a lot of the historical people around Thousand Oaks. So this is my favorite photo of her. And if you remember E.T. in 82, I found these kids up in Sunset Hills at sunset. Um, so I made my own imitation of an E.T. photo. Uh, this is uh, the Dudop Parade in Pasadena, again on my own time. Found these guys walking by and there was this uh, building being demolished and it just seemed to go together with their uh, hazmat suits and stuff. Uh, this is Cheetah. Um, uh, Tony Gentry uh, lives in the Ventu Park Estates, or he did. Uh, until around 1980, he actually had an elephant still on his property there in those tiny lots. Um, but the elephant had been, you know, they had to move the elephant elsewhere. Um, most of the animal actors and things like that, they moved down the Carlisle Canyon. It used to be based in uh, Thousand Oaks more. Um, but Cheetah, this, this chimp was about 50, 60 years old. He wasn't sure the exact age, but Tony kind of led everyone to believe that it was one of the cheetahs that appeared in uh, early Tarzan movies. And he was trying to get a, a star for the cheetah, the character on Hollywood Walk of Fame. That was his big campaign. Um, so I got this photo and uh, moved it on the AP wire and got a lot of publicity for him. Um, but it's, and since then we've come to realize that Gentry, had, uh, the uh, trainer had, several, had gone through several cheetahs, but we do know this, this one what dates back this ch chimp. He had them for all those years. So can't really rule him out as one of the cheetahs that have appeared in a Tarzan movie. And uh, we've got the, President Ronald Reagan's last campaign stop was at Pierce College in Woodland Hills. I went over and covered it. 1984 campaign. And probably everyone has seen the uh, memorial at the uh, Valley Oaks Memorial Park, these arches. Uh, back in the 80s, they used to do these vigils uh, so went over and got this picture. And another one of my favorite places was Egg City, <laughs> uh, which is long gone now. Um, am I going too fast or anything? Or they have these you can always ones. smell eggs on the way to Elkins Ranch Golf Course. You'd always whiff of it. Yeah, I, I couldn't hear you on that one. I say he used to smell like city on the way to Elkins Ranch Golf Course. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think they closed around 90 and the, the property, the, most of the buildings were destroyed in a fire. I don't remember exactly when. Um, I was coming home from work and uh, the tanker truck blew up in Newbury Park. Um, so I was one of the first photographers on the scene and uh, uh, this photo helped get me into the LA Times even though I didn't leave until five years later. I went over to the Valley Edition well, a couple months later for an interview um, with the, uh, and this photo was sitting on the bulletin board over there. So that made my day. <laughs> And uh, one of the things at News Chronicle was we had to cover every varsity sport, 
So we got to shoot volleyball, water polo, cross country, all of them. Um, so this was uh, soccer. We just liked the photo. Most of the time I'll be shooting these with a 300 F4. Uh, and indoors, I would use the 200 28 a lot. And then in basketball, I'd also use a lot of uh, like 85 18. Um, Rick Nelson came to Thousand Oaks for a concert. I think this was 1984. I think a year later, he, he got, was killed. And I can't remember if it was a plane crash, but it seemed like a lot of guys got a lot of rock stars. Yeah, 1984. I have a question. Uh, did you yeah. use motor drives in all your cameras? Yeah. Um, let's see. I used uh, the uh, when I first came to paper, I had two of these AE1 programs, program like the body I showed. Those had basically uh, a, 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 what they called a, a, a motor drive, but it was really more of a winder because it wasn't that fast, but uh, still gave you a plenty. Plenty of uh, plenty of time to get plenty of pictures. Um, we, the News Chronicle, when I arrived, we were using bulk loaded film, and that's one of the things, one of the chores to be done, is we reloaded the uh, cassettes from you know the hundred foot rolls of Triax. And uh, what happened was after I arrived, and we, when I came in uh, in '82, they hired another Joe Looper started two weeks after me. And Roger Hardy had only been there less than a year. And all of us got uh, upgraded our camera gears to include uh, these motor drives, okay? And all of a sudden the film use at the News Chronicle doubled, okay? So they told us uh, we, we had to stay with the bulk loaded film from then on. Couldn't go to uh, preloaded cassettes because we were just shooting so much film, but they weren't too upset because of the quality of the images we were getting. Thanks. <laughs> this is at Newbury Park High School. Uh, I lived in the Old Town section of Thousand Oaks and uh, on the way home one night, I saw these, these two young kids walking down the street at sunset. So grab the photo. And photo day for the Canal Valley Little League. Uh, Hat and Iron Works in uh, downtown Moore Park. I did a story on them. Uh, this was the lead photo, lots of sparks flying. Again, this would be uh, probably a 15th of a second or a full second exposure. Probably did a several different shutter speeds to find the best one. And this looks like I was shot with a 300 F4. Canal Valley days, they used to have rodeos. And if, everyone, if, if everyone's been around here a long time, remember the Canal Valley days used, used, used to be a huge event. So. Um, Sunglasses. And uh, back in the 80s, they used to have hot air balloons launched from Moore Park up at uh, right off at LA Avenue off 23 Freeway. It was one of the favorite locations. And uh, in fact, the first day I worked at the News Chronicle, they had a, a balloon go down up in Sunset Hills. And uh, they were calling fire department everybody on that one, so I had to go check it out. That was my welcome to Thousand Oaks. Um, Ventura Raceway. And I uh, decided to, part, you know, looking for something different when covering uh, July 4th events, instead of shooting the same photo every year, I parked myself underneath the bridge here for the sailboat race around the West Lake, around the island in West Lake Lake. And uh, got this photo of people 
dragging their boats underneath the bridge. And the same day I shot the fireworks show that night. Uh, this actor uh, portrayed Howard Hughes. And at the time, uh, this is 1986, uh, there was two uh, Lockheed Constellation aircraft over at Camarillo Airport. Someone had bought the two and was using one for parts and was re, you know, fixing the other one. So we just kind of snuck over there and he posed like Howard Hughes next to a Lockheed Constellation. Yeah, comment, uh, Scott, I love the grain in the sky. The Tri-X grain is so yeah. beautiful. That's part of the film's beauty right there. Yeah, this gives thanks. it so much texture and uh, yeah. In fact, uh, some lady who knows this uh, actor contacted me about two months ago trying to find him, and I had to explain to him. I only met him that one time. I took the photo. I've been, you know, yeah. the last couple of years, I've been posting a lot of these photos on Flickr and stuff and Instagram. Uh, let's see. Brush fire. I think this was a control burn. Yeah, control burn. But this was uh, in '87. We were starting to shoot a lot more color. You have a lot of names associated with the with the different photographs. I assume you carried a notepad with you and talked. Yeah, to them. yeah. It's called an Ace Reporter Notebook. Uh, here's one. It fits in your back pocket. I still use them today. To keep personal notes on things that I'm doing, like when I do some weird things with a photo, I like to take notes on how I did it. So, so yeah, it fits in your back pocket real easily. Um, and I have a box full of them somewhere. I think I finally had to thin them out because uh, journalists, in you, when you start and you go through journalism in school, they say the things you keep are your notes, always keep them because you never know when you have to go back to them. And um, you know, anytime you ever do anything that gets published, try to keep all your notes, which is, I have a whole different story. If you want, I can get into it in a minute, but we're almost out of time. Um, okay, uh, I was sitting at, at the at the News Chronicle and this fire broke out in a duplex of a war park. So when the people by, after five years of me running out the door, they all, everyone in the newsroom knew something's going on. <laughs> Hustled up there and uh, most of the fire was knocked down by the time I got there, but still got some decent photos. Um, mostly it was because of an extended Hispanic family that uh, became homeless. And a few days later, went back and uh, checked on them. And got this nice photo of the a girl with her soccer ball. Another sports photo. <laughs> always try to. The best photos for me were always the winners and losers. I was less interested in the action. I was actually trying to get the story. Uh, the winners and losers. And I just liked how everyone was in the. The kids were all trying to imitate the instructor. My son took tennis lessons from John Siemens back in that era. I recognized him immediately. <laughs> and uh, the firefighter you showed earlier uh, was later became a fire captain in Thousand Oaks and uh, mm -hmm. came 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 to a a smoke emergency to the house next door to ours once when when uh, kids were little. Yeah. His, his son his son was uh, in the same class as my son <laughs> who is now 40 yeah i know years it's old. a small town still in many ways oh yeah um, always looking for mirrors and uh, um songwriter uh oxnard rescue mission Another place I went and did a photo page on.
don't want to go too quickly, but I don't want to run out of time. So. And uh, we wanted to do a story on the California raisins. So I went out and bought a big box, a couple of boxes of raisins and just had fun. And this lady uh, actually spun her own yarn and made her own clothes. In her shop in Thousand Oaks at the time. Okay, that's all I've got on that. So, any questions now? 